you've said very publicly, like it's just a matter of time mm -hmm. that you'll see ETH ETFs, you'll see Solana ETFs, you'll see XRP ETFs. And I think that will continue to happen. In fact, I think it was just yesterday, the Grayscale yeah. ETF filing basket. is a basket, which yeah. is also, here's just to pat myself on the back. Yeah. <laughs> I, said it, I said there'd be baskets. Right. And it, This episode is brought to you by Gemini, which is one of the top crypto exchanges in the industry. I've been a user of Gemini for many years. They make it easy for you to buy, sell, and trade crypto. Gemini has a lot of unique features. They have a fully functional app, a credit card. They include staking on their platform. And they also have a stable coin called Gemini Dollar, which is USD back. And Gemini is certified, regulated, and licensed. They are available in 70 plus countries. And if you sign up using my code or link, which will be in the description, you can get $15 in Bitcoin when you trade your first $100. So if you'd like to learn more about Gemini, visit the link in the description. Brad, great to see you in person. Really nice to meet you in person. Yeah. Seen your face a lot of times, obviously, in many of your podcasts. For sure. We've done Zoom, Twitter spaces, missed you at the proper party, which was a great time. I, well, I was there, <laughs> but I didn't see you. That was a great time. Well, to be fair, I wanted to see Lenny Kravitz before you, but I feel the same. Lenny was great. He's, he's a legit rock star. For sure. Yeah. Well, great event. Thank you for having me. And I would love to start with RLUSD Stablecoin. How does this fit into Ripple's vision for payments? Is it something different or it's a puzzle piece into the grander picture? It's definitely a puzzle piece in the grander picture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to put maybe a little macro context around it, Ripple has been using stable coins in our payment flows for years. Mm -hmm. And we've used, you've used Tether, we've used USDC. Mm -hmm. There's actually a point in time where we, our institutional flows, represented 20, because of that, we were minting 20% of all USDC. Mm. And so we're kind of looking wow. at that. And then we look at what happened during the banking crisis where USDC depegged by 7%. And, you know, I kind of came to the conclusion, there's an opportunity here, given mm. that we are driving a lot of activity, a lot of velocity, a lot of liquidity. And the fact, frankly, that we have a very strong balance sheet that we felt like uh, there's an opportunity for Ripple to play in this market. I will say our goal isn't like, we're, we're, you know, there's lots of competition in crypto. Mm. Uh, this is for me much more about growing the market. Sure. Uh, you know, I think, I think USDC will continue to do well. Sure. Uh, you know, I think Tether is also here to stay. I think it's a slightly more complicated story yeah. because of Tether's relationship with the United States mm. and the United States government. Uh, and, you know, I've gotten heat in the past for commenting about <laughs> uh tether and i i'm i'm not anti-tether i've made mm. simply the point that like the u.s government because of tether's approach to uh transparency with regulators here in the united states mm. i think the u.s government that, that has created some problems and look what's happened with europe with mica yeah. and the delisting of usdt in some exchanges in europe uh i, I think i doubt tether will tether may continue to grow mm. but i doubt it will have the same market share Sure. in two years let's say so i think there's an opportunity and i think bringing more liquidity on chain bringing mm. more liquidity on the xrpl uh is good for everybody on sure. in the xrp ecosystem so there's talks of stablecoin legislation around the corner in the united states do you think it's going to have a similar shakeup like it did well the eu regulations did where tether may lose some share here and that would be beneficial for rlusd yeah i mean look i think it'd be beneficial for all stable coins that are compliance first, that take a, a regulatory first, a front foot towards regulation. Uh, I don't think it, 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 RLUSD would be one example of that that I think will do well, but not the only one. Mm. So I, I do think we will get legislation, uh, hard to know exactly when, but uh, hopefully sometime the next year, given the election, you know, it's hard to make predictions around that. Sure. Now, with regards to adding RLUSD to the pipeline, is it going to be kind of an a la carte option? You can use ODL, you can use RLUSD. Is it going to be that type of setup for your clients? So ODL, you know, we already, when using on-demand liquidity, uh, which is our product that uses crypto and uses XRP, you can actually, you have corridors where we've been using stable coins and mm -hmm. simply we will start using RLUSD instead of Tether, instead of USDC. Okay. And uh, so I, from a customer's point of view, mm. uh, you know, there won't be any change. Uh, sure. Now we may see new opportunities. And again, 
I think the way RLUSD may get used, particularly in DeFi projects mm -hmm. on chain that may be outside of ODL and sure. are more about the broader XRP ecosystem than specifically Ripple products. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, for me, this is very much an investment in the XRP ecosystem. Sure. Yes, Ripple will use it and will drive a lot of liquidity. Right. As you know well, liquidity in crypto, liquidity in stable coins is very good and important uh, yeah. in terms of keeping t spreads tight. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think that'll be good for everybody. Um, with regards to yield, and I don't, and it may be too early to answer this, but is there plans to launch some sort of yield project or maybe your third party connections may do that? Yeah, I, I am optimistic and hopeful that you'll see yield products on chain, uh, not necessarily from Ripple in the short term, but from other players. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the yield topic is a sensitive one in sure. the United States yeah. regulatory framework. Uh, and so you're seeing people kind of work around that. Mm. Uh, I think it's too early to tell how Ripple will in, engage in that, but mm. certainly we want to watch the market and be industry leading. And then if we see uh, people figuring out good solutions that work from a regulatory point of view, mm. then we would want to uh, engage in that as well. Mm. Let's talk XRP ETFs because I think we're all surprised multiple XRP ETF filings bitwise, I believe Canary funds. Uh, what is your take on the market demand for this product? Well, I was surprised by timing, but not mm. surprised by the outcome. Mm. You know, I think when the Bitcoin ETF came out in January, you know, I said very publicly, like, it's just a matter of time mm. that you'll see ETH ETFs, you'll see Solana ETFs, you'll see XRP ETFs. Mm. And I think that will continue to happen. In fact, I think it was just yesterday, the Grayscale yeah. ETF filing basket. is a basket, which yeah. is also here's just to pat myself on the back. I said, <laughs> I said there'd be baskets. Right. And it, I mean, to me, it's just because that's what investors want. Yeah. That's what, you know, if you, in frankly, some of the advice I give my closest friends when they are interested in investing in crypto, mm. the advice I give them is, look, it, to take a basket approach, right. uh, by the top five, by the, you know, whatever, whatever you think the right framework is. So I think Grayscale's sure. product is a great one. I think there is demand there. Mm. Uh, and I think that's going to bring more uh, capital into the XRP ecosystem, more capital into crypto. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen $19 billion come into the Bitcoin ETF. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's good. And I think it's there will be more in the future. Are you talking to any of those issuers? I don't know how that relationship or dynamic works. Like, do you say, hey, are you guys interested in launching an ETF on XRP? Do you go to BlackRock, Grayscale and things like oh. that? You know, the, the first one, I think it was... I can't remember that the first one that filed, we knew nothing about it. Okay. I think I even tweeted out something like, Oh, that's a surprise. I, I uh, not a surprise in that we kind of predicted this, but mm. you know, no, it's an open source digital asset. Like anybody mm. could, you know, you don't, it doesn't require ripples participation, obviously. Right. Uh, no, we are advocates, supporters. We want to see this happen. We want to see more of them happen. Um, uh, and we think again, it's, it's good for the XRP ecosystem. And so mm. we'll continue to uh, try to push those things forward. Now, I think it goes without saying the SEC is a hurdle uh, for many folks in the industry. Do you anticipate that they will block these ETF applications due to the appeal and other things that are happening? You know, one interesting timing observation, you know, so the SEC had until I think I have exact dates here, but maybe bear with me if I get wrong by a day or two. Mm -hmm. I think they had until October 7th to file their appeal mm. and they filed it early and they filed it early after getting two ETF applications for XRP. And you wonder, is that because they were trying to send a signal to the market? Mm. You look, I, I think the SEC is acting outside of the law, mm. period. I think you have a rogue agency who, you know, literally as you're seeing in the bitnomial lawsuit, yeah. A federal judge has ruled that XRP in and of itself is not a security. Mm. Yet the SEC is calling people saying, well, we still think XRP is a security. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know all the different laws about what can and can't be done. But, mm. you know, if uh, if you have someone going out and mis I mean, that's not acting within the law. Mm. Like, in my judgment, yeah. a kind of lay person as a non-lawyer, it's just not what you expect from your government. Yeah. And, you know, if if you've lost, you can appeal and it may 
I mean, and there's, I think, a small chance, but if they get that changed in the appeal, if they chose to actually try to appeal is XRP a security, mm -hmm. which they haven't even said they're going to do. Right. But yet they're going out into the market saying they still think XRP is a security. This is not ethical behavior. Yeah. And it's funny. I, I saw a report this morning that Gurbir Grewal, the former, well, now former director of enforcement, yep. he came out saying, we, the SEC needs clarity uh, from Congress. There needs to be rulemaking so we can regulate the market better. But when he was at his position at the SEC, he was saying something different. So it's so strange. It's it's almost, I don't know what's going on there. Strange. Like you're, you're being kind, you're being generous. <laughs> I mean, look, one of the things I've enjoyed about, you know, we're obviously here at Ripple's Swell Conference. And one of the things I enjoyed about the people on stage yesterday is I thought there's a lot of candor. Mm -hmm. I thought there's a lot of people kind of speaking truth, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I hear stories like that, that the former head of enforcement is after, I think he was at, within the walls of the SEC for a couple of years, mm -hmm. To leave and then say that hey we need clarity you know get like this is not what we as a citizenry should want from our government mm. uh I, I don't eventually it will be fixed because right. chair gensler will not be the chair at some point soon yeah. uh we can debate how soon we can debate who will be next but i think no matter who wins this election i think you know gary gensler's days as the chair of the sec are are numbered but Brad, do you think this is part of a larger macro problem of the disruption is happening? You, the technology you provide is disrupt. Crypto, blockchain is all disruptive. And the incumbents and even people in the government are struggling and they're just having a knee-jerk reaction. Like, we don't understand this. We don't know where the currency is going. You know, in the traditional system, we know what the treasury is doing. We know what the Fed is doing. We can monitor what liquidity is going, but now it's going to crypto tokens. And for them, it's like, pump the brakes, do whatever you got to do to roadblock all of these things. I, I I don't know that it's that coordinated. I mean, you're seeing mm -hmm. other, you're seeing other leading financial markets, mm -hmm. London, Tokyo, sure. Geneva, I mean, Switzerland, like mm -hmm. the UAE and Dubai. These are all financial capitals of the world. You're seeing all of those markets with regulatory frameworks. They've, they've leaned in. Mm -hmm. They've said, hey, we, we think it's here to stay. Yeah. We think it adds value. We think it can actually be accretive, if you will, from a making the financial infrastructure more efficient. Mm. That's good for everybody. Yeah. Uh, so to see the United States, it will in particular the SEC, and you know, I, I'll I'll say the Biden administration's approach to crypto, I think, has been deeply flawed. Mm. And it's not really just the SEC, right? right. You have, a, you know, you've read about uh, Operation Virgin Choke Point Two Point yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I personally have been debanked. Mm. Uh, you know, I think a lot of crypto companies have trouble getting bank accounts. Wow. Uh, you know, th these are frustrating realities that they really are, I think, acting outside of the legislative authority that Congress has given some of these agencies. Mm. Uh, it's frustrating for sure. Uh, you know, the, the, this is why Ripple has fought the good fight. Yes. Yeah. And I think that the industry needed people to step forward and fight the good fight with the SEC. And I'll uh, maybe slightly arrogantly say, I think mm -hmm. it's emboldened the community around yeah. crypto to be more aggressive with the SEC. You saw crypto.com filed suit, obviously consensus filed suit against the SEC. And so <clears throat> obviously the SEC has lost more than a few times when it came, mm -hmm. when it comes to their crypto approach, you have, uh, I'm going to mispronounce the commissioner's name, um, a, a recent commissioner was on CNBC and he said, Mark Ueda. Yes. Ueda, okay, yeah. Ueda. Thank you. And he said, I mean, he described the SEC's approach to crypto yeah. as a disaster. <laughs> disaster. Yeah. I agree with commissioner Ueda. <laughs> uh, you know, unfortunately chair Gensler, uh, I think he's put his head in the sand and wants to create laws that don't exist. Mm. You know, he, 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 his SEC created this idea that digital asset security, it's fiction. Like yeah. there's, there's no legal basis for this. And it's funny, they've, they're have they being hypocritical in one case. They'll say, we apologize. We didn't mean to cause confusion. And the next case, we're using this term. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, particularly with Bitnomial, yeah. they're using actual documents from a case they lost against Ripple, right. but not acknowledging that they lost the case. And it's like, wait a minute. I mean, again, I, I don't know what's legal and illegal because I'm not a lawyer, mm. 
but I do know it's right and wrong. Mm. It, it, that that isn't right. Yeah, that that isn't appropriate. The United States government should not be picking winners and losers in a market. Mm. That isn't the government that the United States, you know, that we, we all as U.S. citizens, I think, believe in. Right. And it, you know, people forget that before the SEC got involved in the ETH. Is it or is it not a security? And mm. is around 2018. XRP was the second most valuable digital asset. I remember that. They, <laughs> you know, the SEC gets involved. They mm. kind of give upward pressure to ETH. They give downward pressure to XRP. Eventually, I think those things sort out over a long arc of time. Mm. I think XRP will stand on its own with regulatory clarity. It, you know, I think we already have it, but we need to keep that fight going. But yeah, XRP serves a very compelling use case around payments, given mm -hmm. its speed, given its low cost, given its scalability. I think you're gonna have a lot of winners in the crypto world. It's, a, mm -hmm. I, I believe very much in a multi-chain world and uh, XRP will, I think, clearly be one of the winners in that, that ecosystem. So Brad, despite all the headwinds we face with the SEC and other agencies, we're seeing some progress in Congress and then you have presidential candidates who are campaigning on crypto. Fit21 made out of the house with Democrat support, which surprised many folks. There's talks about getting a version of that through the Senate by the end of the year. Are you optimistic that 2025, knock on wood, is the year we get comprehensive legislation? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought you were going to say 2024. Okay. Yes, uh, <laughs> there is still talk that something gets through the Senate this year, and that I'm not as optimistic yeah. about. I, I, I want yeah. to believe. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's going to be uh, tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, like I, I, there is momentum around this. And again, I think regardless of who wins the presidential election, I think there's momentum around this. Mm -hmm. you, as you highlighted, Fit21 would be a big step forward. It did have you know, pretty broad bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll continue to see forward momentum on a stablecoin bill. So I, I think we will see that. I will also take a moment, though, to remind people that although the United States is the largest economy in the world, mm -hmm. The rest of the world is actually doing stuff and yeah. it is moving forward. I mean, it Ripple's customers, 95% of our customers are non-US. Mm. There's a lot of people doing really good things around crypto. It's just the US is frankly backwards. They're behind. And I think, you know, five years from now, the this will all will look back. It'll have been a speed bump. We'll keep mm. moving forward. But sometimes I feel like we over-index as uh, you know, we're here in the United States today in Miami, but sometimes I feel like we over-index on what the going on in the US yes. and we lose sight of how positive and constructive things are going on around the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a question I forgot to ask you earlier about stable coins and the US dollar being the world reserve currency. Um, and there seems to be an attack on the status of the US dollar as a world reserve currency. There's a bunch of other countries trying to use other assets for trading or currencies for trading. Do you think the, the US is in danger of losing that status if it doesn't move fast enough with stable coins? Well, I think stable coins help the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the fact that some people in Washington DC don't understand that is indicative mm -hmm. of, they need to learn, they need to understand. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, like, I think <clears throat> the rumors of the US being, dis, the, the US dollar being dislodged as the world's reserve currency, uh, what's the, the rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. Sure. You know, the, people have talked about that for decades and mm. we haven't really seen it change too much. Mm. You are seeing, you know, particularly uh, in certain uh, country pairs and currency pairs, kind of some alignment to try to avoid the US dollar. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to change dramatically sure. anytime soon. Uh, mm. And I think in some ways, the US should lean in yeah. to what I think some in government don't understand is by leaning in, they're actually helping preserve that uh, dollar dominance, mm. as opposed to in some way, uh, disrupt or, you know, see it atrophy. So Brad, there's a question a lot of people want me to ask you. So uh, let's say we get legislation. The Kansas next year. Jayhawks <laughs> will win the national championship. That's not it. Unfortunately not. <laughs> That if there is clarity next year and, and we are in a different environment, a regulatory wise, will Ripple IPO? I mean, look, it, an IPO has not been a high priority for us. No. Uh, and part of that is because the SEC is not our friend. I, I'm not really popular. They don't have like pictures of me <laughs> in the halls of the SEC. Yeah. Uh, unless they have dark words on them, maybe. But, uh, but you know, you have to remember most companies go public because they want to raise capital. Hmm. 
you know, we have been fortunate that we are in a strong financial position. We have continued to make acquisitions. We've continued to invest in lots of different projects around crypto, around XRP. And so, you know, for most people, it's there's an urgency to go public and they're talking about mm. going public as quickly as they can because right. they want to raise capital. Sure. So we have a couple dynamics here with Ripple. One is we have a hostile SEC, hostile US, mm. you know, environment. And we have a company that doesn't need to go raise capital. And so it's just right. been a back burner topic. Mm. So uh, look, I, I think we want to make sure our shareholders have liquidity. We want to make sure right. our shareholders are happy. We want to make sure the company is valued appropriately. Mm. Uh, and so we don't take anything off the table. Sure. But uh, I also just acknowledge it's not a it's not a high, high priority. priority. Uh, you know, and honestly, even when I think about it, you know, usually when a company says, okay, we're going to go focus on going public, it still takes 12 plus months. Mm. And so, you know, if you see, I mean, I think, I think Gensler will be gone sometime <laughs> next year in my judgment, uh, that, you know, even if you said right then, okay, let's, let's go prioritize this. It'd still probably be 12 months. Sure. So, you know, that, that gives sense. you a, a best case scenario. For sure. Final question here. What's your outlook on the crypto market as we head into 2025? Do you see us, con not price predictions, but do you see us continue to move upwards? Yeah, well, that is a price prediction, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I think the tailwinds around crypto, uh, and you're seeing a little bit of a rally right now. Mm. It's almost amazing to really think about, we've had so many headwinds affecting mm. us. There is obviously FTX. Yeah. There's the banking crisis. There's been Elizabeth Warren out there, you know, screaming from whatever, for whatever reason about how all crypto is bad. And, and again, you have in the U.S. government a pretty hostile, the largest economy in the world, the largest capital markets in the world. And that's starting to change, mm -hmm. you know, the, the ETF. And I mean, look, Tony, honestly, you'd agree with this. The fact that a player like BlackRock. Yeah. And you told me, I think they're the largest asset manager in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100 percent sure about that, but it, they now have a CEO who's talking about like the tokenization of real world assets, like, mm -hmm. some of the blockchain enablement. And I, I think it, it will continue to have capital flowing into this market. Mm -hmm. So I think the tailwinds are growing, headwinds are abating. Right. I think that means good things for crypto prices at large. Uh, you know, I, it's always hard to predict when. So sure. when, I, when I think about this, I think I'm very optimistic. The question is, what's the time frame? Sure. Mm. Hard to know. Right. Uh, I happen to think it's probably sooner rather than later. We, we haven't had a big crypto rally in a long while. Uh, and so I'm I'm pretty optimistic about the next year or two. Awesome. Well, can I have your commitment that you'll come on ne uh, next year on the podcast? Tony, you have that commitment. <laughs> uh, we'll even do it in person again. I, awesome. I'm in New York all the time, so we'll, we'll find a time to be together in person. Or maybe I come down to Miami so I can get beach time as well. So <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Tony. Awesome.